Welcome to Critical Sage using point of care ultrasound. I'm really excited to be here today and help launch the Sonai Sight Institute and also share some of our great cases over the years. My name is Steve Leach. I'm an emergency physician in Orlando, Florida. I was an early adopter of point of care ultrasound because I, I saw how clinically useful it was and I really couldn't imagine my practice today without it. I think of the countless times it's really saved me from making tons of mistakes. It's a great tool for the ED and critical care environment. It's really ideally suited. Uh, it's portable, it's fast, you can roll it right to the bedside. And it really, within seconds, gives you life-saving information in critical cases. Uh, during today's webinar, we're going to review five key cases. Um, they have several things in common. All involved critically ill or injured patients. In every case, ultrasound is a key component of a great patient outcome. And the ultrasound skills in each case were basic level skills, really within the scope of any acute care provider. Let's review our first case. This case was critical in us establishing our point of care ultrasound program about 10 years ago. It involves a 58 year old male brought by emergency medical services. He had a history of hypertension and was a smoker. His chief complaint was low back pain after a fall from a riding lawnmower. His vital signs on arrival were a heart rate of 90 with a blood pressure of 105 over 60. He was seen and evaluated by our triage nurse with a working diagnosis of mechanical low back pain due to fall. He was placed in our hallway uh, for one of our physicians to evaluate. On physician evaluation, they took a history and found out that the fall was due to syncope. What had actually happened in this case is the gentleman who was riding his lawnmower had sudden severe back pain first and then passed out and fell off his lawnmower secondary to that. They also noticed his borderline hypotension in a gentleman with a history of hypertension. And on physical exam, he had a questionable pulsatile abdominal mass. The patient had no history of AAA, but it was concerning in this clinical setting. A point of care ultrasound was immediately performed at the patient's bedside. Here are the images from this case. This is a transverse view of the abdominal aorta, distally close to the bifurcation. In the far field, we can see the spine casting a shadow, and just anterior and to the left of that, we see the patient's aorta. In this case, we're identifying a distal abdominal aortic aneurysm. Uh, aneurysm is defined as a measurement more than three centimeters, and you can see in this case, this was close to seven centimeters. This is a sagittal view of the aorta, with the transducer indicator towards the patient's head. Again seen is this large abdominal aortic aneurysm. In this clinical setting, it was presumed to be ruptured. Ultrasound is an excellent test for the diagnosis of the presence of an aneurysm, but is not necessarily reliable for signs of rupture. In this case, our final diagnosis was a ruptured AAA. We obtained immediate vascular surgery consult who came to the emergency department and evaluated the patient. The patient was felt to be stable enough to go for a CT angiogram, which confirmed the presence of a large ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. The patient was emergently taken to the operating room where an endovascular stent graft was successfully placed. The patient had an uncomplicated hospital course and was discharged on day three. This was an important case in us establishing our point of care ultrasound program. Let's review some teaching points from this case. Mortality in ruptured AAA is up to 80%. Many patients do not survive to hospital admission, and even on patients that do make it to the hospital, the mortality exceeds 50%. Rapid recognition and identification of ruptured AAA is key. Point of care ultrasound is a near perfect test for AAA. It's portable, it's rapid and has excellent accuracy. The sensitivity and specificity are both in the high 90s. In addition, there's a steep learning curve. There's multiple studies showing that novices perform almost perfectly. In this case, point of care ultrasound was the key factor in making this early diagnosis, which led us to prompt correct treatment, leading to an excellent clinical outcome. Let's review our second case. This was a 22-year-old female 
with her history of asthma. She was found collapsed at home, clutching her asthma inhaler. On EMS arrival, she was found to have agonal respirations. And on arrival in the emergency department, she was in cardiac arrest. Our initial triage diagnosis was cardiopulmonary arrest due to asthma. During her initial evaluation, she had immediate endotracheal intubation. On physical exam, her lungs were clear with no wheezing and good air entry. She was easy to bag with low inspiratory pressures. This led us to question the diagnosis of cardiac arrest due to asthma. As part of her initial evaluation, a point of care ultrasound was immediately performed. Here are the images from this case. We started with a FAST exam to evaluate the cause of her cardiac arrest. To obtain this view, we have the transducer on the right lateral rib cage with the transducer indicator towards the patient's head. We can see the liver and the kidney, and we also see a large amount of free fluid in Morrison's pouch in the right pericolic gutter. This is a view of the left upper quadrant. To obtain this image, we have the transducer oriented towards the patient's head and the posterior axillary line of the left lower rib cage. We can see a large free fluid collection in the left subphrenic space. This is a transverse view of the pelvis. To obtain this image, we have the transducer oriented towards the patient's right and we're imaging down into the pelvis. In this case, we see a large amount of free fluid in the anti-uterus and what appears to be a right adnexal mass. Evaluating the right adnex more closely, we can see what appears to be a gestational sac with a fetal pole. Using the zoom feature on our ultrasound machine, we confirm the presence of right adnexal mass with a gestational sac and a fetal pole. Our final diagnosis in this case was ruptured ectopic pregnancy with hemorrhagic shock we immediately started blood transfusion and aggressive resuscitation. An immediate GYN consult was obtained, who reviewed these bedside images and took the patient emergently to the operating room. Here are the intraoperative findings. This is views from a laparoscope looking down into the pelvis. When they entered the abdomen, they found about 2,500 mLs of blood. As they suctioned the blood out, they were able to identify the uterus in a ruptured right fallopian tube. Here's the image after repair. The patient had an uneventful hospital course and was discharged on day two. Let's review some teaching points from this case. The FAST exam isn't just for trauma. It's an excellent test in many situations, including unexplained hypotension, suspected ectopic pregnancy, and in cardiac arrest looking for a treatable cause. Ruptured ectopic pregnancy is the leading cause of early maternal death. It kills young, healthy women and is a true can't-miss diagnosis. In the setting of a positive fast with a positive HCG, it's almost 100% likely that the patient has a ruptured ectopic. There's evidence to show that patients with a positive FAST and a positive HCG need operative intervention. In this case, we were proceeding down the wrong pathway with a wrong initial diagnosis. Ultrasound let us get the proper diagnosis, get on the right diagnostic path, mobilize the correct resources, and help save this young woman's life. Let's move to case three. This was a 66-year-old male with a history of hypertension, diabetes, smoking, and multiple cardiovascular disease risk factors, who presented to the emergency department with some chest pain. It was left-sided, and it was a bit atypical for acute coronary syndrome. His initial EKG was non-diagnostic, and initial troponin assay was negative. His chest X-ray showed congestive heart failure and a left-sided pleural effusion. The initial diagnosis was atypical chest pain in a patient with multiple cardiac risk factors, 
The plan was to admit him to the hospital to rule out acute coronary syndrome. During his ED stay, the patient decompensated. The pain became more intense and also began to radiate to the back and epigastrum. Due to the change in the patient's clinical status, a point of care ultrasound was immediately performed. Here are the images from this case. This is a parasternal long axis view of the heart. To obtain this view, we have the transducer in the left parasternal space between the fourth and sixth rib, and the transducer indicator is oriented towards the patient's right. We can see the right ventricle in the near field, the left ventricle in the far field, with the aortic root towards the right side of the screen. Let's review the abnormal findings on this study. First, we can see a small circumferential pericardial effusion. It does look small and does not seem to be causing any right ventricular collapse. It's definitely of concern, but does not seem to be causing any hemodynamic compromise. The other concerning finding here is a dilated aortic root with what appears to be an echogenic intimal flap. This would be consistent with the type A aortic dissection involving the aortic root. We can also see this intimal flap in the descending thoracic aorta posterior to the left ventricle. Additionally seen is a moderate sized left pleural fusion in the left pleural space posterior to the pericardium and posterior to the descending thoracic aorta. This is a still frame showing an aortic root diameter measurement of 5.67 centimeters. A normal aortic root diameter is less than 4 centimeters. This is a transverse view of the proximal abdominal aorta. To obtain this view, we place the transducer in a transverse orientation in the epigastrum. We can see the echogenic spine in the far field with the aorta just anterior and towards the patient's left side. We can see the celiac trunk exiting the front of the aorta in this case. Again seen is this intimal flap in the proximal abdominal aorta. This is a sagittal view in the same case. To obtain this image, we have the transducer oriented towards the patient's head in the epigastrum. Again seen in this case is the presence of an echogenic linear intimal flap. Our final diagnosis in this case was a type A aortic dissection involving the aortic root. Based on our point of care ultrasound findings, we obtained immediate cardiovascular surgery consultation. He was taken to the operating room where a transesophageal echocardiogram confirmed the diagnosis as well as the presence of aortic valve incompetence. The patient underwent successful repair of his aortic dissection with aortic valve replacement. He had an uneventful hospital course and was discharged on day six. Let's review some teaching points from this case. Aortic dissection is a true emergency. It's very rare, it's deadly, and even with the correct diagnosis, it has a high early mortality. It's a difficult diagnosis to make. Signs and symptoms are nonspecific and may overlap with many more common diagnoses, as was the case here. Ultrasound has excellent specificity, so it can be used as a rule-in test if the point of care ultrasound is positive. Early and prompt recognition is key. And in this case, it allowed us to start correct medical and surgical therapy. Point of care ultrasound in this case led us to find the proverbial needle in the haystack. Let's move to case four. This case involved a 24 year old male involved in a high speed MVC. He was an unrestrained driver and there was significant damage to the car. His initial GCS was five he had a heart rate of 140 and a blood pressure of 80 over 40. He's brought to the trauma center with extensive bruising to his chest and abdomen. Our initial working diagnosis was hypovolemic shock due to blunt abdominal trauma. As part of his primary trauma survey, a fast exam was immediately performed. Let's review the images from this case. This is a subcostal four chamber view of the heart. To obtain this view, we have the transducer oriented towards the patient's right, with the transducer in the epigastrum at a shallow angle. In the near field, we can see the liver, and in the far field, we see the heart. In addition, we see a large pericardial effusion with right ventricular collapse. 
This was a completely unexpected finding. We obtained additional multiple views in this case, including thoracic and abdominal views. Thoracic views were negative for pneumothorax and hemothorax, and abdominal views were negative for intra-abdominal free fluid. Our final diagnosis in this case was blunt cardiac injury with tamponade. We immediately performed an ultrasound-guided pericardiocentesis, which stabilized the patient for transfer to the operating room. The patient went to the OR with our trauma team, who called in our cardiovascular surgeon due to the ultrasound findings. In the operating room, they found that he had a blunt cardiac rupture of the right atrial appendage. This is usually an unsurvivable injury, but due to the fast diagnosis uh, using point-of-care ultrasound, the patient had an uneventful hospital course and was discharged day four. Let's review some teaching points from this case. Blunt cardiac rupture is exceedingly rare and wasn't even really on our radar in this case. There are so many other causes of shock and hypotension in this situation that we would have been unlikely to consider this as a primary diagnosis. It's almost always 100% fatal. Many patients die immediately and that those that don't die immediately only have a few minutes. Therefore, early recognition is key. In this case, without point of care ultrasound, this patient would have likely died. Let's review our last case. This patient was an 82-year-old male brought from a skilled nursing facility. He'd suffered a recent ischemic stroke with aphasia and hemiplegia. He'd been recently discharged from our hospital. He was brought back to the emergency department for fever, hypoxia, and hypotension. His initial chest x-ray showed a right lower lobe infiltrate consistent with aspiration. Our initial diagnosis was septic shock due to aspiration pneumonia. As part of his initial evaluation and resuscitation, a point of care ultrasound was performed. This is a subcostal four chamber cardiac view. To obtain this image, we have the transducer in the epigastrum with the transducer indicator towards the patient's left and the beam at a shallow angle. In the near field, we see the liver, and posterior to that, we see the heart. This image really made us question our initial diagnosis. Typically, with septic shock, you have a distributed or hypovolemic pattern where you expect to see a flat right ventricle. In this case, we see a dilated right ventricle. We can actually see flattening of the intraventricular septum during diastole. This is a subcostal long axis view of the IVC. In order to obtain this view, we center the probe over the right atrium and then rotate the transducer indicator cephalad and we sweep the transducer to find the IVC running in long axis through the liver. Again, this was a bit of a surprising finding for us. We expected to see a flat collapsing IVC to go along with more of a distributed septic shock picture. But in this case, we see a dilated non-collapsing IVC. Normally, your IVC diameter should be between one and a half and two and a half centimeters. And with spontaneous respiration, you should have about a 50% collapse. In this case, we see a dilated IVC that's greater than two and a half centimeters with minimal respiratory variation. What this suggests is some type of obstructive shock rather than a hypovolemic or distributed picture. This is a parasternal short axis view of the heart. In order to obtain this view, we have the transducer in the left parasternal space with the transducer roughly oriented towards the left shoulder. We can see the right ventricle in the near field and the left ventricle in the far field. We're getting a cross-sectional view through both ventricles in this view. What we can see here is a dilated right ventricle. We actually also can see that intraventricular flattening. Normally, the left ventricle should have a round or an O shape in this case, it takes on kind of more of a D shape as the right ventricular pressure increases. What this is showing us is that the right ventricular filling pressure is exceeding that of the left ventricular filling pressure. This is an apical four chamber view in this patient. In order to obtain this view, we have the transducer at the PMI with the transducer indicator towards the left axilla, and we align the, the beam angle along with the long axis of the heart. 
we can see the right ventricle towards the left of the screen and the left ventricle towards the right of the screen with the atria below. The normal RV to LV ratio is less than 0.6 to 1. We can see in this case, the right ventricle is markedly larger than the left ventricle. We can also see that the right ventricular free wall has a lot of hypokinesis. It's not contracting well. These findings suggest acute core pulmonale. We also obtained views of the leg veins using a linear transducer. This is a transverse view of the right common femoral vein. To obtain this view, we have the transducer oriented towards the patient's right in an inguinal region. You notice we use compression to attempt to compress the common femoral vein. You can see that we have a non-compressible femoral vein. This is consistent with an acute femoral vein DVT. Another finding of DVT is a filling defect on color Doppler. You can see that there's no flow through the center of the vein. We also checked the popliteal region and you can see the popliteal vein in the near field on this image and the popliteal artery in the far field. We have the transducer in a transverse orientation in the popliteal fossa. You can see with compression, the vein is non-compressible. Again, consistent with the popliteal DVT as well. Our final diagnosis in this case was obstructive shock due to massive pulmonary embolus. Due to the patient's instability, we immediately consulted our pulmonary critical care service. With his recent ischemic stroke, he was felt to be at high risk for hemorrhage with thrombolytic therapy. He was transferred to our interventional radiology suite where a catheter-directed embolectomy was performed. The patient made an uneventful recovery and was discharged back to the SNF hospital day five. Let's review some teaching points from this case. Point of care ultrasound is great for differentiating shock states. A study by Jones et al. in Critical Care Medicine 2004 found clinical judgment was only 50% accurate versus ultrasound, which was 80% accurate. Different combinations of ultrasound findings can get you on the right track. In this case, obstructive shock was characterized by a dilated hypokinetic right ventricle along with a dilated IVC that has no respiratory collapse. Our original working diagnosis was distributive shock, in which case we'd expect to see a hyperdynamic LV along with a flat RV and flat IVC. Right ventricular strain has prognostic value in the setting of QPE. Clinical outcomes are worse in patients with right ventricular dysfunction. Therefore, a more aggressive management should be considered in these patients. Point of care ultrasound can be used as a rule in in the right clinical setting. In a patient with high clinical pretest probability, these findings should prompt aggressive and early treatment. This case is great in illustrating how ultrasound can change one's decision making. We were going down the wrong path initially, but the ultrasound findings led us to the correct diagnosis. Let's wrap up and review. These are the cases we reviewed during today's webinar. We're only really scratching the surface of what's possible using point of care ultrasound. We have hundreds more cases just like these ones in our experience. In each of these cases, the clock was literally ticking and ultrasound was the key component to a great patient outcome. It literally helped us save lives at the speed of sound. Thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions at this point.